Now I have a message this evening that's probably uh, different somewhat from what I'd usually bring on a Sunday evening. And nevertheless, we're, uh, I had different messages on Elijah from over the years of preaching. And I have preached on different angles on the man Elijah. And as I thought about this for this evening, I got another angle and another few thoughts on Elijah and his ministry. And I want you to turn with me, please, to the book of James chapter 5, please. James chapter 5. And we'll read just two verses, and then we'll go to other places. James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Elias, or Elijah that is, that is Elijah. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Let's pray. Father, would you now take your word and will you inscribe your own word into our hearts? Father, would you take these clay lips of mine and will you use them for your glory and for the honor of thy Son, the Lord Jesus, in his name? We ask you, Father, that this night be over. Maybe there's one here that knows not the Lord Jesus as their own Lord and their own personal Savior. We pray tonight that even this message would go forth to the heart and strike the heart to realize their need of him. Glorify his name. Use me for your glory and for your honor, I pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. A man of Elijah, a man of passions and prayer. As I said, since we have dedicated little Elijah, I got to thinking on this and it isn't the usual message that I would bring, but nevertheless, what is usual? Notice here, James says a few things before we get to our two verses that we have read this evening. James encourages the church. He encourages the blood-washed. He encourages the saved. That's you and I who are trusting in Christ. And he says in chapter 5 and verse 7, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, a husband and waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I notice James is encouraging us to be patient. Even in James' day, he knew the Lord would come, and the Lord has still not come. We're living in the last of the last days. And we can tell by the way the world is going and the things that the Lord has told us in his word to watch and to look for. And James says, look, have patience. The word patience here means to have long patience. It doesn't mean to say for five minutes or even for a week or for a month. James is telling the church, be long spirited and be long in patience it means to persevere to persevere he's telling the church persevere in times that you and i are living in persevere when things are hard when they're difficult and it means to persevere and not to lose heart not to lose heart am i speaking to someone tonight and you've started to lose heart there's many a times we can lose heart when we look at what's happening in our nation. When we look at how even every time we mention Christ or the things of Christ or the Word of God or the Gospel, that which is evil is good and good is now evil. Light is for darkness and darkness is now in the place of light. And it's easy to lose heart as a Christian. Brothers and sisters, James, he tells us, be patient and do not lose heart. Persevere. 
For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, he says. Now the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second coming, we believe is even at the doors. We don't know the day and we don't know the hour, but James tells us to hold fast, to persevere even through the times that we're living in and the times that lie ahead. He says, be patient. Notice, secondly, he tells us to endure, to endure. Verse 11, behold, we count them happy which endure, he says, because he's speaking from verse 10 of the prophets, the ancient prophets who were bringing the word of the Lord to the nation, to the people. And the prophets came and said, thus saith the Lord, and they were put in pits, and they were cut asunder, and they were outcasts, and they were cast out, and they were unwanted, and they were run through with the sword, and they were decapitated, their head taken from off their shoulders. And these prophets stayed steadfast in the word, and they brought what God had given them. And James says, the prophets have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Now, if they can have patience, church, then surely you and I can have patience. We think of those who came through the Reformation. We think of those from the early church, from pagan Roman Empire, and it's, it's cruelty toward the church. We think of that which is happening even today around different countries to the church. We need to be patient, and we also need to endure. Verse 11, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. You know what he's saying? He's mentioned the prophets. Now he mentions the old patriarch Job. And he says, think of Job and all that he had lost. And he says, and what Job lost, God done more for Job at the end than what Job had lost at the beginning. So when you and I stay in patience, when we endure, we'll realize that God who is for us and not against us as his children, that which we have lost, we heard a lot of it this morning, and I was thinking, Pastor Michael, you're going to preach off my sermon here if you don't stop it. That which we have lost or has been given away, which we have counted but dung, that we may follow and serve Christ, we'll find that that is a greater glory for the Christian when we have patience and endure. The word endure here means ready. It means to hold fast to one's faith. Am I talking to someone you're losing faith? Faith in Christ, that is. It means to hold fast in one's faith, and it means to bear bravely and calmly the ill treatments that you're feeling, that you're going through. Someone treating you uh, and it's not right. Ill treatments. You can't bear it at times. and pulls you down. It drags you down. Well, James says, be patient and endure because the blessing of the Lord is greater when we continue steadfastly to follow him. Brothers and sisters, you keep faith in Christ and you go on with him no matter what. No matter what the world is saying, no matter what people are saying, no matter what society doth offer, you keep going on with God and watch what your Lord will do. There's a greater weight of glory that's coming for the people of God. Notice then he says, we're to pray. In patience, endure, pray. Patience, endure, pray. Now, this isn't a condemnation. I want to ask you a question. Have you prayed today? I'm not talking about here, when we're all together. Have you prayed today? Did you pray this morning? Did you pray this afternoon between meetings? Did you come aside for a minute? Even though it was for five minutes, did you come aside? Did you pray? Did you pray before you came to the meeting? Did you pray and ask the Lord to speak to you? Pray without ceasing, Paul tells us. I pray when I'm driving the car. I talk to the Lord everywhere I go. I pray when I'm walking down the street. It's a communion. It's a fellowship with God. I go into my study, yes, and I kneel and I pray. Sometimes I lay on my face and I pray. Yes, I do. But I pray when I'm walking down the street. I pray in my head. I talk to the Lord. I pray whenever, believe it or not, I made all their dinner last night. <laughs> and I was praying when I was cooking a steak. 
That's the first time in seven years. <laughs> she was counting, not me, by the way. <laughs> Talking to the Lord. Just closed the door and I was in the kitchen. I thought, I'm going to do this. And I, I just worked away in the kitchen. And as I was doing, I was talking to God the whole time. And guess what? It turned out great. <laughs> Notice here, pray. Verse 13. Notice what he tells us. Is any among you afflicted? The word here for affliction, uh, it's a, a word, kakapatheo. And this is what it means. It also means hardness. Hardness. Is anyone going through a hard time? Is anyone having a real hard time? An affliction of time. So here James shouts to you, is anyone afflicted? Is anyone among you afflicted tonight? What's your answer? Let him pray. Let him pray. Let her pray. For example, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. Listen to what Paul says. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The word hardness is the same for affliction. In James chapter 5 and verse 13. It's the exact same word, only Paul saying, endure the affliction like a soldier. Endure the affliction, the hardness of it, like a soldier, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He says, any among you afflicted, let him pray. Notice what he says in verse 14. Is any sick among you? Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So here again he says, pray, pray. Pray again. Is any among you sick? Now we think, oh, well, it has to be a terrible, dreadful illness for me to have to do that. No, it does not. The word here for sick is a, is a word, anastheneo. And this is what it means. Are you weak? Do you feel feeble and frail, without strength, powerless, needy? A real needy touch is what you need. It also means diseased and sick. But every single ailment of the child of God, he says, are you afflicted going through a hard time? Let him pray. But are you sick, whether it's in body or in mind or in spirit, or whether you're weak and tired and afflicted and you have no strength? He says, then call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Notice again, verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. Notice here in verse 15 and 16, we have the prayer of faith. And then in verse 16, we have the faithful prayer. The prayer of faith and the faithful prayer. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Notice here in verse 16, confess your faults. Now notice, friend, please take note, this is not confess your sins. It is not confess your sins. There's only one you confess your sins to, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess your faults. If you've done wrong with a brother or sister, if you've wronged them and hurt them, confess your faults your weaknesses to them. Even if you need prayer, say, look, here's my fault. Confess it to them that you'll be prayed for and that the Lord will be able to raise you up. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Notice the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now notice this, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. See the effectual, fervent prayer. Effectual here is the word anergeo. Anergeo. And it's where you and I get our English word energy from. Energy. And it means the prayer that is powerful. The prayer that is mighty. The prayer that is intense. So that's the effectual, fervent prayer. The fervency gives the idea of a pot with a lid on it coming to boiling point. And you ever get your kettle in the, 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 it starts to shake sometimes with the boiling water and the steam's flying out of it? That's the idea of it. It says, come before the Lord. 
coming with a mighty, powerful prayer and cry on to him as though it's at boiling point you are and pour yourself out before the Lord. Cry and cry again. Come and come again and pray aloud unto your God. Notice he says a prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth not, pardon me, availeth much, availeth much. Now notice the Bible tells us, it says there's none righteous. Notice there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. It's not one of you righteous. I'm not righteous in ourselves. There's not one of us sought after him. Not one of us wanted to know him. But rather, he came for us. He came to us and he quickened us to behold his son, the Lamb of God, who would die in our place instead. Notice this. He says, you're not righteous. The man and the woman that's unsaved and outside of Christ, you're not righteous. The man and the woman have never been to the cross and trusted in the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter whether you walked a thousand miles in broken glass and bare feet. It doesn't matter you climb Crook Patrick in Ireland. It doesn't matter whether you wear a hurry shirt and go and hide in a cave and whip yourself off to death and starve yourself, that does not bring you righteous before God. Nothing you can do can make you righteous before God. Well, then how do I get righteous before God can? You come with all of your sin, repenting and saying, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus has paid my debt. And come to the cross to be washed in the blood. He takes your sin and he gives you his righteousness. Friend, you can only be righteous through the blood of the Lamb, through trusting in Christ alone. There's many who think that at the last moment they'll, uh, they'll, they'll shout, Jesus, forgive me. I do believe in you after giving him a, 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 a fag butt end, as one preacher said, at the cigarette butt end of the life. And this is the King of glory, the Lord of hosts. Notice this. We're told here the prayer of faith shall save the sick. We're told that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail it much. And when you're in Christ, you're righteous. No, that means you're declared by the Father. You're declared by God himself, not guilty. Can the guilty sinner, can the guilty sinner, can the man who deserved to be going to hell, can who was on the broad road to destruction, can the man who was the, the man who deserved everything that God could give him in judgment and penalty, and God would have been justified to send me to a devil's hell. Ken didn't receive that. Ken received the righteousness of Christ. Because Cain came to the cross and under the blood. Have you been washed in the blood as we've been singing? We've been singing it. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood tonight? Are you washed in the blood tonight? Are you washed in the blood tonight? Are you washed? in the blood of Christ by faith? Have you been to the cross and been washed in the precious blood of Jesus tonight to cleanse you from all your sin? <coughs> Didn't say how many times you've been to church or how many times you want to come back to see your tea or, or not come back here at all. We're not asking you what you've done or what you've accomplished, how rich or poor you are or wherever you're from. We're asking you, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? For that's the only way you can be forgiven. And that's the only way you can ever be saved. It's through the blood of Christ. The Father declares all those who are in Christ righteous. Righteous. Ken, you're righteous. But, but I feel you, Lord. You're righteous, Son. Why? Because you're trusting in my Son. You're trusting in His blood. You've been to the cross and you're following after him. I'm speaking to someone tonight, and you've never been to the cross. Well, tonight you can find your way there. 
because it's being presented to you tonight. Come to the cross, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Notice here, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. More prayer, brother, more power. Less prayer, less power. And guess what? No prayer. No power. Have you prayed, sister? Are you a praying brother or sister? <coughs> Elias or Elijah were told in James chapter 5 and verse 17. Notice, and I love this. I'll tell you why. I've said all that for a reason. Elijah, in chapter 5 of James verse 17, was a man subject to like passions as we are. Love it. Thank you, James, for reminding us. Thank you, James, for putting that there. You see, Elijah was a man. He was a man subject to like passions as we are. Elijah was flesh and blood. Elijah was tempted and he was tried. He was a sinner. This powerful prophet, this powerful prophet was a sinner. He was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Did his mother conceive him? He was a sinner. Every one of us are. The only one that was born sinless in the whole of the history of humanity. The only one was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Sinner, what will you do with your sin? Sinner, how will you get rid of your sin? You can't, it's in your nature. It's in your very nature. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He had feelings and fears and feelings. He had functions and reservations and affections. He had bodily needs and desires just like every man and woman in here. He was fully human. I want to tell you something. As I said, the Lord Jesus Christ was the only man he was born without sin. He's fully God, yet he's fully man. Fully God, yet fully man. And I love it when the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 writes these words. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. That high priest is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ was tempted in every single point that you're tempted in. The Lord Jesus Christ was tried in every single way that you have been tried in. The difference is we are sin and we succumb to the sin. It says, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, listen, yet without sin. He had no sin. He knew not sin. He did no sin. He was yet without sin. Perfect. Perfect man. Jesus is God's perfect man. And he is man's perfect God. Did you get that, friend? Jesus is God's perfect man. And he is man's perfect God. That's the one who bled and died for you at the cross. That's the one that went and took your sin and shame in his own body on the tree. Bled and died for every one of us that we might be saved. I can ask you a question, friend, if you haven't been to the cross. Think about this. If it took Jesus, the perfect man and the perfect God to go to the cross to save you, what would you give for your salvation? There's nothing. For that's what it took. Christ to die, the Son of God. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. Listen, as God, as God, he knows me. Okay? He knows me, everything about me. He knows you. As God, he knows you. As man, he understands me. He 
He partook of the flesh, the nature of man, the seed of Abraham. As God, he knows all things, but as a man, he fully understands me. What it's like to be tempted. What it's like to be tried. What it's like to be cold. What it's like to be hungry. What it's like to be tired and weary. What it's like to feel pain and anguish and agony and suffering. As man, he fully understands it for Jesus bore it all and he took it all for you. A man thinks he'll end up in God's glorious heaven without coming to Christ. Notice, James shows us Elijah. He runs down telling us to be patient. And he tells us to endure. And he shows us to pray, running in, and he just all of a sudden from the prophets to Job, he shows us one prophet, Elijah. Why? Because Elijah was a man. (laughs) Elijah was a man like you and like me, a human being. And yet God used him for his glory. Yet God took a man like that and used him. James shows us Elijah as an example of a frail and failing mortal man and as an example to come to God in prayer. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the revelation of God who came to men as a man, that men like you and me and women would be able to go to God in prayer. What a privilege it is to be able to be in his presence. What a privilege it is to be able to be in God's presence. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Elijah was a man who at the end of his ministry was carried away in a whirlwind, we're told. He's, he is carried away in a whirlwind. And Elisha, his understudy, cries up to him as he's being taken up. The chariot of the Lord and of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, he's not saying he's going up in a chariot. That's what we hear. It's not what he's saying. He's saying, Elijah, you are the chariot. You are the horsemen of Israel. That's the witness this frail human being left. Elijah was a man carried away in a whirlwind. The Lord Jesus Christ was a man who carried his cross up Calvary's hill. John 19 and verse 17 says, And he, bearing his cross, went forth into the place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. He carried the cross, the God-man, God come down, In flesh, the Son of God and the Son of Man, he carried the cross, bleeding the whole way to Calvary's hell. Here's what man does. I don't want you all my life. Couldn't care less about you. Hate this gospel stuff. This is what they do. But do you see when the end's in view, if they get the end in view, start to change their mind. I had a family member, I'm not saying which one it was, because I don't want, don't want to offend any of my family if they watch. It wasn't an immediate family member, it was a different one. And they were sinful all their lives. I mean, just out there, living, full sinner. I can't go into the the way they lived, but they were sinful all their life. Flaunting it, they were atheists. That's what their words were. They were atheists, and their family were all atheists, and we're all this, that, and the other. We could just give you a line of what they said, and when I got saved, oh, this God that I supposedly followed, well, he was a fable, a fantasy, and a fairy tale. I was in Victoria Square 
in Belfast one Saturday afternoon. Jody and Ellie were just two wee, wee nippers this height, two wee totes. And Alice and I were walking through, my phone rang, and there it was one of the relatives phoned me. Did you know that he's very ill? I said, no. Been ill for weeks and weeks. I said, knew nothing about it. Nobody told me. Where is he? And they told me, so I went. And I went to the hospital. And really, when I went to the hospital, they were just completely overwhelmed by the sickness that had ravaged this family member. Is he okay, Wendy? It's it's maybe too warm for him, isn't it? Bless him. We Nathan, hey? You're all right, son. You're okay. Good man. Not a sound out of him too. Look at that, eh? Brave boy. Brave boy. I want you to listen to this. This is important. I remember going to his bedside. Everything was irritating him. He was just ravaged with cancer. It was like this. Still see him. He used to dye his hair all different colors. It was all still weird, wonderful colors. Couldn't really get speaking to me much. And I leant over and I says, I'm here to talk to you. I want to tell you about the Savior. And one of the family members came and took me away and says, leave him alone and don't you dare talk to him about God. Leave him alone and don't you dare talk to him about God. And I had to leave the hospital. Stood outside and I prayed. I says, Lord, I need an opening. And I phoned uh, another pastor and I knew we were having a prayer meeting. And they, they got down to praying just for me to get an opening with this family member. And in the middle of the night, early hours, I got a phone call from the same family member who told me to get lost, basically. He woke up, you ready? Petrified. Petrified. He said to his sister, and all the words he could muster up. They called me Kenneth now, so get me Kenneth. She asked, what is wrong? He says, I'm terrified. He says, I'm terrified. Phoned me and I got dressed and I flew down to the hospital. And they were just glad to have me there. I walked into him, and he was moaning, oh, I'm groaning with the pain. I went over and I put my hand on him. I said, you want to see me? Now? I said, you're terrified. Yes. I said, Christ can save you. Do you want to know this Christ that I love? Yes. Pointed him to Christ, and he died within two hours. An atheist. There's no real atheists. Not really. There's only pride filled people who think they're bigger than God. But when it comes to it, when it comes to it, you'll find at the end, when you close your eyes in death, the wages of sin is death. You'll find that after this comes a judgment. judgment. I prayed for him. I'm going to do part two on this because I've just left my notes again as usual. I prayed for him. And he relaxed. Still in pain. And I went out and there was an old friend there. And he went in and I waited out in the hall. 
And even in his dying moments, the old friend that was taking him to hell with him tried to stir him up away from Christ in his damn breath. Tried to stir him up to take him away from Christ in his damn breath. Friend, don't let your friends and your family take you to, away from Christ in your damn breath. Or in this life, in this breath. I'm going to round this up. Thank you for your attention. Christ went bearing his cross to the place called Golgotha. Bearing his cross. In Matthew 8 and verse 17, it says, He took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. We're told by Peter, He bore our sins in His own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. Elijah means my God is Yah. Means Yah for Jehovah. Elijah, El, E-L means God really. Yah, Elijah, for Jehovah, or Yahweh. God is Yah. Yah is God. That's my God, he says. The Lord Jesus Christ, his name means Yah is salvation. Here is Yah, clothed in flesh, in the person of the Son of God. And here we find that he bears it all in the tree. In Exodus 23 and verse 21, the Lord talking about a theophany. Pastor Michael was on theophanies this morning. I thought, oh, here we go again. He's going to steal this sermon on me. And the Lord says he would send a theophany. It's called an angel, not a, not a created being now. This is a pre-Bethlehem appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. My angel or my messenger, my Servant, as it were, will go with you. He says that to Israel. And listen to what he says. Not to hear him and not to offend him. I'm paraphrasing for time's sake. He says, listen to what God says, for my name is in him. Yah. He is Yah. Jehovah. Yahweh. For my name is in him. And when Christ comes in a body of flesh, born at Bethlehem, in John chapter 5 and verse 43, this is what he says to his disciples. He says, I am come in my Father's name. This is the one they crucified. This is the one who shed his blood for you and died for you. So I'll tell you this, and that's me close. I we went to the Marie Curie. Oh, I can't remember, 20, 18, 20 years ago. I was asked to go and see a good Christian brother in the Lord. And they had given him months, and the months had passed, and they were waiting on him. But he was sitting talking. And I went to see him, and this is what he said. I went with another pastor. Sat down to talk to him and he says, You ready, Christian? He says, Pastor, if I only had more time. You ready, Christian? That's what he said. If I only had more time, ask him please to give me more time. Because I wasted too much. If I only had more time. I would serve him with all my heart. That's what he said. I would serve him with all my heart. You see, friend, there's only one life. It will soon be passed. It's only what's done for Christ will last. 
Christian, let's be up and serving. There's going to come a time, should he tarry, that we'll all stand before him to give an account. Talking about the believers now, we'll give an account. We'll not be lost, but we'll give an account for our service in Christ. And I surely don't want to stand there ashamed face. And if you're not saved, you'll stand at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. You're not going to be asked how many times you cursed, how many cigarettes you smoked, or whatever you did. You're not going to be asked how many times you even slept around, or how many <laughs> alcoholic drinks you, you took, or how many clubs you frequented. He knows all of that. He knows it all. I'm not going to ask you that. He knows it. He's going to ask you, what did you do with my son? What did you do with him? But I didn't even know him exactly. But he died for you and you rejected him. Pastor Michael Bunting also mentioned about knowing the Lord, knowing him. There's going to be those who will say, we have done this, that, and the other. And he'll say, depart from me, I don't know you. And someone might have turned around and say, well, sure, God knows everyone. Yes, he does. Well, how does he not know you? The word know means to know in an intimate fashion. To know in an intimate way. To know with intimacy as a husband is intimate and knows his wife and the wife her husband. He said, do you know me intimately? Do you know me? Intimately, in relationship, relationship with him. Elijah says, my name means my God is Yah. Jesus is my God. My God is Yah. And God's word, well, next week, because I had six points, I never got them, what was my introduction? And I got carried away somewhere else. Next week, there's six points Elijah did throughout, and I'm going to bring them out and show you them. Six points. My God is Yah. You see, you can have Christian written on a, a lapel badge if you want. You can wear a wee cross around your neck. You, know, you can bring all the nice jewelry out. You can get your big tattoo done saying, Jesus Christ is Lord if you want. But you know what'll happen? Absolutely nothing. You can get your denominationalism and say, I bear it on my chest like it's something. I, I, I grew up a, a good Ulster loyalist. Let me tell you something, you die without Christ, you'll die an Ulster loyalist too. Spend eternity without him. I'll tell you something, friend. If you don't know him, he's going to say, do you know me intimately? Because I don't know you. My God is Yah. Wendy and Paul, Paul's got the child, Wendy. May he grow up, little Elijah, to be able to say, not just in his name, but be able to say, my God is Yah. Jesus is Jehovah. May God take his word to all of our hearts tonight for his glory. Amen.